to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest Sandy Allen, who's here today to share with us their new book, A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, a true story about schizophrenia. Sandy speaks about mental health, gender, normalcy, and power. Sandy's essays and feature stories have been published by BuzzFeed News, CNN Opinion, Bon Appetit, Pop-Up Magazine, and many more. Sandy was previously BuzzFeed News Deputy Features Editor. They also found and ran the online literary quarterly, WAGS Review. So let's welcome to the show, Sandy Allen. Thank you. Thank you for having me. What a pleasure it is to have you here, and my goodness, your book is really questioning what people think when it comes to schizophrenia. Well, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> Tell, well, telling a new story, yeah. Yeah, well, and you know, I know there's a lot that goes behind this, but why don't you share with us some of the inspiration behind writing this book? Yeah, sure. So this book was one that in a funny way was like a sign to me. Um, I was, I was just living my life. This was about 10 years ago. Um, and I got a call from my hermit uncle, Bob. And that was the word he used for himself was hermit. He lived in the desert in um, Northern California and he was someone who exhibited existed at the fringes, you know, of my consciousness and, and, and the family. He was just a bit of an odd figure off there playing guitar in the desert and leaving people voicemails. And sometimes, you know, when I was a kid, he'd be at family reunions and stuff, but I didn't really know him all that well. And then he called me and, and he wanted to mail me something he had written. Um, and I said, sure. And he, he mailed me this document that he had typed in all capital letters on his typewriter. And it was uh, his whole life story from his childhood to the present. Um, and it was uh, very inventively spelled. It was punctuated with colons. It was no paragraphs, so kind of just these great walls of text. And the pages themselves stunk like cigarettes. And at first, I just, I was so turned off. I was like, ugh. And I put the whole thing back in the envelope, and I put it in a drawer, and I tried to um, ignore it. Uh, but he had, on the very first page, he had typed kind of a quick summary of what it was. And it said, this is a true story of a boy who was brought up in Berkeley, California in the 1960s and 70s who was unable to identify with reality and therefore labeled as a psychotic paranoid schizophrenic for the rest of his life. And so that that little that glimmer of what the story was about, you know, it really did um, grab my my attention. And, and eventually my curiosity got the better of me. And I read the whole story, or at least, you know, I tried to read the whole story that first time through. And, and yeah, my, my entire head really started to change about schizophrenia, but also a lot of other stuff. Uh, it's, it's interesting when we look at people that carry these labels of mental health and mental illness, you know, just how that affects them their entire lifetime. Yeah, and in Bob's in Bob's case, I think there was this example of kind of what that really looks like in practice. Um, he was a teenager in Berkeley. He was he, he definitely struggled to fit in in school. He he had a really tumultuous home life. His parents were divorcing. Um, it was an era that was really tumultuous. You know, he was right in the middle of it. Really, there was like the bloody Thursday riot on Telegraph Avenue. There was Hendrix was playing in town. All the great bands and a lot of cultural cataclysm that I think maybe to someone a little bit older than him would have just been exciting, but he was kind of a young person around all this stuff. And um, yeah, by the time he's driven to that hospital at 16 and put in the cell and injected with antipsychotics and given that diagnosis, you know, he's really already kind of drifted from a lot of connection to people. He's already kind of lost a lot of his friends and he's he's been kicked out of school for fighting. And so I think he was someone who in a lot of senses was was really not um, being supported as he was an adolescent. And then as he's 16 years old, he's already in the mental health system, given a label like schizophrenic. And that really becomes his life. Um, he's in that system and he, he has to take these medications. And, and if he doesn't, you know, he ends up in trouble with, you know, whether it's his, his, his parents or his doctors or, you know, it's basically his life becomes one where other people are telling him, you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, and I think he was someone from the get 
let go who was really not interested in, in what other people um, told him to be or do. You know, he loved Jimi Hendrix. Um, he, he didn't want to go to school. He wanted to walk around barefoot and play guitar and drop acid with his friends. I think that that was way more his interest when he was a young person. <laughs> well, and that, that's very, you know, that, that's very telling of the times, too, because that's kind of what people, you know, there's a right. whole era of, of exploring different types of freedoms. And so. Right. And that was one of those questions I had, you know, really immediately when I read his story was I was picturing my grandfather, Bob's dad, who was this super traditional man of that generation, World War II generation, like, you know, did everything right, went to law school, you know, just was like the most, um, uh, did did everything the way you're supposed to do it um, style guy, and then had this son who was so not interested in conforming. And I recognized right away that this was hardly a unique story in America at this time, that you had parents and children who stood so far apart, um, you know, from one another on a cultural level. And I remember initially thinking, huh, did Bob get misdiagnosed with schizophrenia because he was a hippie and his dad was a square? Um, and I, for a lot of years, you know, I think that was one of my, my, my hunches about the whole situation was that Bob was someone who kind of by nature of what was going on culturally in, 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 in between these two generations became rather unrecognizable to the people who were in charge of him, you know, like his dad and his psychiatrist. Yeah, it was, most likely there was this level of expectation for him to act and be one certain way when he was going to be his own way. I think so. Yeah, I think so. And I think that what's tough about being in the psychiatric system is that, you know, a lot of your, if you're already in the system, if you've already got a diagnosis like schizophrenia, like never mind why you got it, you have it. And if you act out, you know, that's now a symptom of your mental illness. If you're upset about something, your anger is, you know, going to be attributed back to that. If you're paranoid because people are sticking you with needles that, you know, are chemicals that are interfering with your brain, you know, that paranoia might be attributed to your mental illness. You know, a lot of what can be very understandable emotions within their context can all of a sudden be pathologized. And I think that in general, Bob's whole life, everything he did, everything he didn't do, all became kind of trapped within this frame of that diagnosis, this sense that he was someone who was abnormal, but not just abnormal, like deficient, broken, you know, that there was something irrevocably damaged about him and that the the lot in life, therefore, was that he had to take these medications or else, blah, blah, blah. You know, he was always someone who had a lot of systems around him that were really forcing him to do this or that. And if he rebelled against those, you know, he would he would wind up in further trouble. Um, and so that's one of the things that I'm, that I'm talking about in A Kind of Miraculous Paradise is in just really closely watching Bob's story through, I think we sort of start to understand perhaps just a little better some of the ways in which a diagnosis like schizophrenia is, is failing to help an individual like him. Yeah. Well, and so when you look at, because I, I know he, um, you know, when you talk about his family life in, in the book, I mean, it talks about how he was with his mom at one point and then went to go live with his dad. And, you know, and it's interesting just how the family seems to have been a little bit um, like he was divided within the family at some point. Oh, yeah. You know, I think that's really, that's really keen. Like he, He's coming up in a household where there is a lot of disagreement to begin with. Yeah, that was one of the things that, as a, as a writer of this book, you know, that my process was a little funny. Like, I was sort of, um, I was, the project was begun by Bob. I was assigned as its, you know, second and final author. Um, and for a lot of years, I really just sat with his text. I really just had his story and my little computer, and I would sit there and look at his story and try to render it in, in this other form. But I had no, I had no imagination imagination that it would ever be a book. You know, it just didn't really seem like anything that anyone would want to read. And um, I had a lot of concerns about the real people in the family and, and what they might end up um, thinking a, a, about this idea of a book based so closely on something that Bob had written. And I was aware of the fact that in Bob's 
parents, you know, my my grandmother and grandfather. Um, that had been a divorce in the 60s that was still felt in the family. I was born in the late 80s, and, you know, I was really aware of the fact that, oof, that side always thinks the sky is that color, and that sky, you know, the, that side thinks the sky is another color. Like, there was just always a disagreement. And so I knew that attempting to write a story about Bob was going to be a problem from all sorts of points of view, but one was that this was a, a, a part of the family where there was a big um, tendency to divide, you know, if there was any uh, any notion people would disagree about it. So I knew that if I was trying to write about Bob, it was really likely that everybody was going to see everything really differently. Um, and it turned out that that was true. I eventually interviewed everybody in the family, everybody who had talked to me, everybody who knew Bob. I tracked down people I didn't even know if they existed. And I said, hey, how do you remember this and that and this and that? And, of course, people had really different memories um, of, of all these things. And I think that's one of the things that my book is ultimately about. How do we talk about something like schizophrenia, for example, when there are such conflicting accounts of what this is? Um, if we try to look at Bob and what he thought of all this versus what the psychiatric profession says about it, those are completely different versions of reality. So as a writer, I have a problem, which is, am I going to only include one and not include the other? No, I think that's not really doing my reader a service. I have to try to figure out how do I balance all these different accounts kind of in a solution together in a way that will help people, you know, move their own understanding along. Well, it's interesting. When we talk about schizophrenia, a lot of people hear that title and get afraid because they don't understand it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's it's a word that um is very loaded. Uh it has a lot of very negative connotation. Um whatever that is, you know, for some people that might be fear. Um for some it might be they're just kind of grossed out or they don't want to engage with it. But I think in general, yeah, like a word for this is stigma. You know, it's a very stigmatized word, but I think that's actually a little soft. I do think that schizophrenic is one of those words that's um, so loaded, uh, so much so that I honestly fought my publisher to not have it in my title, you know, because um, I was worried that um, people would be turned off just because of the word in the title. And ultimately, I didn't win that fight, and I think that's a good thing. I think it's a better book because it has the word schizophrenia in the title. And ultimately, I don't think that the word itself um, is is where our focus should be. You know, I think there's actually more important stuff at hand, but I think it's important that we highlight um, to ourselves the fact that, hey, this is a prejudice that a lot of us carry around. A lot of us carry around a set of ideas about what psychiatric patients are. You know, we've been taught all this from, you know, these are stories that we've learned from the movies and we've learned these stories from the nightly news, this idea that psychiatric patients are mad that they're evil, that they're committing crimes, or that they're not trustworthy, or whatever it is. You know, this is all just stereotype. This isn't real. There's a lot of data that that does not support the idea, for example, that psychiatric patients are more violent than not psychiatric patients. If anything, psychiatric patients are 10 times as likely to be the victims of violent crimes. And I think that's such a good example of where the popular imagination around this category versus the reality is so split. Um, and in this text, I'm just trying to bring us kind of all into one conversation as much as I can. Well, I applaud you for that because it is something that people think that's very difficult to discuss, but we need to have these conversations, you know, because over time, I believe that the stigma will fall away and people will be more informed, will have more information and really understand that there are a lot of people that have this diagnosis, you know, and, and you're right, it doesn't make them evil or wrong or bad. Totally. And there's a lot of people who love those people. You know, and it hurts it hurts a lot of folks when the when the stereotype, when the prejudice is allowed to just exist so freely. Um, and I think the more we be, we become aware of that, the more that we can again then begin to address the really real question of how should we be making sure that people with a diagnosis like this or without a diagnosis like this, because that's really the point. You know, something like psychosis, which sounds so scary perhaps, there's no guarantee that won't ever happen to you or me. You know? Um, that's just that's the 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 at the end of the 
the day, science and medicine haven't really figured these things out. Um, and at the end of the day, I think if you allow people like Bob to have a role in this conversation, if we allow, you know, if we listen to people who've really been there about what this is like and about what could be helpful and what, what isn't helpful, I think that, you know, we, I think we would all do better if we were to have a more honest conversation about the possibility of these kinds of things and the fact that this doesn't need to be a damnation. This doesn't need to be the rest of someone's life if they've had an experience that is maybe very, in, in the moment, maybe very frightening, you know, to them, to themselves or to, you know, most likely others. Um, but yeah, I think right now we have this, uh, tendency to want to pretend like, hey, if someone has something that they go through that's really concerning to others, that means that that's the rest of their life and there's nothing else we can do for it. And, you know, that's just really not supported by the research. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And you mentioned this in your book, you know, how family members would use like some of the words like crazy when they discussed Uncle Bob, you know, when and that, that leaves like a kind of connotation like, oh, you know, we shouldn't spend too much time with him. He's crazy or, you know, that's just the way he is. And, and it's interesting how that can be pushed down from generation to generation unless, you know, someone like you starts questioning it, going, well, what what really happened here? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, when when my mom is saying, oh, he's crazy, I think she's telling me what she heard you know and um a lot a lot of what ends up being said about people who've had diagnoses or who've been in the psychiatric system is in a in a way it's hearsay it's something we've heard second hand you know we've heard it from a doctor and so now it's true um and i think that in general i'm i'm asking and i i think i also want to just underscore a point which is you know the position that families are put in when they've got an individual like Bob who winds up with a diagnosis like schizophrenia is a really tough one, especially in America in this era, um, both in the 70s and now. I think that families end up often being the people who have to figure this stuff out, and I think often families are not equipped to do that, um, and that there is this uh, this burden that can be put on people, uh, and if, you know, if they don't magically fix everything, then they're blamed, and so I think that caretakers are also really not um, being set up or served well by the system that we have, and and I think that, you know, my mom calling her brother crazy, I think she that's that's what she heard he was and i think that was the explanation that was given to her not only within her family but within our society you know that we've really been content to let that be the the answer and of course if you turn to someone who's been called crazy and i mean i've interviewed so many people who've been in the psychiatric system so many people who've you know gotten diagnoses like schizophrenia or borderline personality disorder or bipolar etc if you ask them hey are you crazy you know or do you identify you know as schizophrenic is that is that how you think of yourself, you know, it is almost never does someone really think that's the extent of who they are. People are always saying, well, no, you know, and, and they, they want to tell me about the experiences they've had in, in, you know, in, the, in the, diagno- you know, the system, the, the moment of being diagnosed, and they want to tell me about the person who was making that judgment about them and so on. So I think that what happens if we start having a dialogue in this space, what happens if you really start listening um, to people who might take issue with the fact that their their stories, their experiences, their emotions, their their mental you know uh, processes or, or whatever have been judged and then determined by someone else to be abnormal to the extent that they are um, broken, disordered. Um, and I think a lot of individuals uh, really take issue with that. But right now, you don't necessarily hear about that. You don't necessarily hear about them. And I think part of that is that social bias against listening to people who are, quote, crazy. So that is a really pernicious catch-22, as you can probably hear. Um, if someone's been deemed crazy, you no longer listen to them, et cetera. And I think that sort of tough position is the one that Bob was writing out of when he sent his story to me. What are some of the surprising things that you learned about your Uncle Bob? Oh, I love that question. Um, he baked great bread 
that totally surprised me. Um, there was this uh, era of his young life when he was 14, 15. He spent a couple of summers hiking with these other young boys and, and donkeys in, in the Sierra Nevadas in, in California. And a bunch, I interviewed a bunch of those guys, you know, and they hadn't seen him since they were 15 and stuff. And so their memories of him were completely different, right, than what anybody else remembered. And they were all like, you know, why are you asking us about Bob? Did he get famous? Um, and, uh, yeah, they would tell me about the bread that he baked using just like a stone cooker. Uh, that totally blew my mind. I had no idea. Um, let's see. He was, I think he was a really good guitarist, especially when he was young. A lot of people would describe, he was a big Hendrix aficionado and he was really someone who I think aspired to have that ability to really, really play guitar like Hendrix. And so he was someone who was so devoted to his music for his entire life. I mean, I knew he was a musician, but when people would describe to me how he used to play when he was a young person in the 60s and 70s and stuff, I was a little surprised that people were genuinely blown away by his guitar abilities. And I think the maybe the reason I'm highlighting some of his his abilities um, is because, again, I think a diagnosis like schizophrenia can, can cast such a pessimistic light around a person. It can cause us to sort of decide ahead of time that he has nothing to offer. Another thing about him that really surprised me is that he had an incredible incredible memory. Um, He wrote his entire story sitting in his little house, and I later fact-checked it. You know, I really, I pulled all the events out on the wall in a long timeline, and I really tried to look at the world events as he described them, and then what everybody else said, and like, I was so surprised as to how watertight his story was. Um, and that was impressive to me because I don't know if, if you sat me in the desert for decades by myself, would I be able to write my entire life out really accurately? Hmm. I know I couldn't. <laughs> so, I mean, and it's interesting because a lot of times when people have these type of labels, they're written off, you know, as, as, you know, mentally unstable and not with it. And so to hear that he has written his story so well, you know, there's a lot that they, that gets overlooked by, you know, some of the talents they have as well. Yeah, I think Bob was someone who was repeatedly through his life put in a basket, put in a a specific, you know, box. And he was always frustrated with the fact that people would assume less of him or that he wouldn't be presumed to be able to do something. Um, And I think that, like, part of that was that sometimes he wasn't able to do everything. You know, I think that this is one of the things that's very tricky and one of the reasons that in conversations about disability, it's really crucial that folks with that lived experience are part of the conversation. And I think it's why, in general, what I'm hopefully having us do is just have a broader conversation about the status of normalcy and whether normalcy matters or should we have a society that is um, more accommodating of more kinds of people because I think ultimately that's one of the things that Bob's story really brings to the fore. Yeah, like Bob was abnormal, sure. You know, he's a weirdo. Um, I'm sure there was a lot about him that that really wasn't, um, you know, the the Kendall version of society. But that being said, did he need to be punished chemically for his entire life because of that? And electrically, you know, he received electroshock most likely when he was a teenager. You know, is that really a, a fit answer for someone who has been perceived as, as sort of not having some, some essence called normalcy? I don't know. You know, I think that I end up uh, agreeing with Bob about some of the really big stuff at hand. And that's not to say that someone like him doesn't need help. Maybe that I don't, for example. Um, but I think that in general, the neurodiversity movement is about freeing us up from this idea of sort of the hierarchy of like, oh, there's good and there's bad. You know, I think we need to be thinking more in terms of like, practically speaking, people are all individuals and people often have really different ways of experiencing the world, of interacting with others, of processing emotion and so on. And and also people have been through stuff. I think that's one of the real, uh, the, the things that has to be brought more and more into any honest conversation about mental health and mental illness. We have to be thinking about trauma. We have to be thinking about stuff, you know, social oppression like racism and, and bigotry and, and uh, sexual oppression, that these are things that actually end up affecting people internally and expressing themselves and, and wind up diagnosed as mental illness. So if we have a system that is actually thinking about the fact that individuals can 
can end up suffering in these ways. And so I think there's a there's a really ups, a big upside here is that I think when you start involving people like Bob in these conversations more and more, there is more hope because I think there is a way forward if we're being really attentive to the role that, you know, interactions between people can play in forming these kinds of negative experiences. And then the fact that there can be a lot of power and healing that can come from, for example, stuff like friendship, stuff like community, stuff like getting to uh, have access to meaningful work, supportive housing, um, access to nature and spirituality. These can all be huge ways forward for people who might uh, struggle quite a bit with, you know, quote, quote, you know, normal stuff like having a job or maintaining relationships. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't even imagine going through some of the things that um, your Uncle Bob went through. I mean, if someone put me through electric shock therapy, I probably would be having some issues, you know. So to put people through that and then to expect for them to be like, oh, okay, you're okay now or you'll you'll be fine for the next month or so and you have to take all these meds. I mean, I think that would put anybody in some type of a psychosis. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? I think that um, people who end up in the psychiatric system and who end up in positions where they are perhaps no longer able, you know, to make decisions about their own health care regarding stuff like medication and ECT, you know, they, they are often very frustrated with the fact that their autonomy has been taken from them. And and there is a really big conversation that I hope our society figures out how to have about whether or not psychiatric patients deserve full civil rights, you know, Um, and and how exactly can we create a system that is attentive to the fact that, yeah, if someone is in a completely altered state, you know, that might be really tough for the collective, you know, how can we make sure that they're safe and we're safe, but also why does a mental health care, you know, why does that need to mean that someone is losing their ability to make decisions about what chemicals go into their brain or whether electricity goes into their brain. Um, And I think that, you know, historically and now, people uh, in the psychiatric system are so vulnerable to abuse, um, and there's so much uh, tragedy that is just totally not acknowledged. And I think there needs to be a big reckoning at some point between this system and the fact that it does violate people in all these ways. And, and, And and the fact that, you know, these are people. Bob is a person. You know, he's a, he's a full person. And I think that's uh, on some very basic level, that's really what my book is about. Um, and, and I think by that I mean it's, it's about us recognizing the fact that we have taught and we have, we have, we have, we have learned and, and we experience a lot of the time a prejudice against people like him that we might not even be conscious that we have, you know. But it, we have it nonetheless and it expresses itself in, in all these various ways in our society. What are some of the things that you'd like readers to take away from your book? I mean, I often, I think really, uh, I want people to just listen to the story. That's really all I want. I want them to listen to Bob's story. I think there's something so valuable um, inherently in listening to the account of, of someone like Bob written really, really closely to his account of himself, you know, just his his story on his terms. Um, I do think that that activity of giving yourself over to his nar- his narrative um, is an important one, um, and I think it's a sort of humble one. You know, we have to let go of, of maybe our preconception of, of who he is or what he is because we heard a word like schizophrenic. Um, so I think that's really it. I think that once you start listening to the story, the story works its magic on you. Um, and that's all Bob. That's not me. You know, I'm just kind of a conduit here. I'm like a waiter. I'm a go-between. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really don't think there's much beyond that. I think that the the power, the reason that it's important for us to listen to his story, we understand it as we hear his story. Yeah, you really have a good understanding. Well, you know, Sandy, where can people connect with you and learn more about your book and be part of your community? Yeah, so um, my website is hellosandyallen.com, S-A-N-D-Y-A-L-L-E-N, hellosandyallen.com. 
And so there I've got um, a resources page that's got all kinds of um, organizations and books and podcasts and stuff. If people want to learn more, I've obviously got all the info about the book and where to buy it. Um, and I always like to say it's available uh, now in paperback and hardcover, but also an audiobook, um, which I think is a really fun way to experience this story and the audiobook. Um, what I recorded part of it and an actor uh, recorded the Bob part. So it's an audiobook in two, in two voices which is also kind of special. Um, but, yeah, hello, com. Well, Sandy, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been an honor to spend this time with you, Sandy, and to talk about your new book, A Kind of Miraculous Paradise, A True Story About Schizophrenia. Again, you can find Sandy's books at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and all indie bookstores. If you'd like to connect with Sandy, you can at the website hellosandyallen.com. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.